Hello, everyone. In celebration of Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, we are thrilled to welcome Christine Ha to discuss her journey becoming blind as an adult and her career as a world-renowned chef. Christine Ha is a first ever blind contestant and season three winner of the competitive amateur cooking television show, Master Chef with Gordon Ramsay. Additionally, Christine was also a co-host on the Canadian cooking show, Four Seasons, and a judge on Master Chef Vietnam. Christine has also spoken about disability advocacy at the United Nations and served as a culinary envoy overseas for the American Embassy. And in 2014, she received the Helen Keller Personal Achievement Award from the American Foundation for the Blind. And Christine's first restaurant in Houston, The Blind Goat, was named a semi-finalist for the 2019 Best New Restaurant in America by the James Beard Foundation. Her second restaurant, Xin Chow, opened in September 2020. She holds a Master of Fine Arts from the nationally acclaimed Creative Writing Program at the University of Houston. And in addition to all these amazing accomplishments, uh, she also has her first cookbook, Recipes from My Home Kitchen, Asian and American Comfort Food, which was a New York Times bestseller. I also want to note that today we will be raffling books to those who ask questions, so don't be shy and drop your questions and comments on the right-hand side of this live stream. And I'll make sure to read them out to Christine during our Q&A section. So please join me in a warm welcome for Christine Ha. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Hey, Christine. <laughs> Welcome to Talks at Google. How are you doing today? Coming off I'm... a celebration of your birthday, right? <laughs> and, you know, anniversary? <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I mean, yeah, this past weekend, we um, had some milestones. I celebrated a birthday and an anniversary, but I mean, it was really only kind of in spirit because we've just been so busy with the restaurants and we just moved houses as well. So but it was kind of you know, busy unpacking and stuff. I did see some family, which I haven't seen in a long time um, since now we're all fully vaccinated. So that was nice, but nothing too big. But I feel like the older you get, like the kind of smaller celebrations and the smaller joys that happen in life is good. So on, on a day when there's no news, is that's good news. <laughs> that's amazing. Congratulations on all those milestones and the new home, you know, anniversary, birthday, a lot of, you know, exciting developments in your life right now. Um, you know, because we're talking still during the pandemic and a lot of us are still at home, I would love to know, since you're an acclaimed chef, what has been your favorite meal to cook during the pandemic? <laughs> That is a good question. Um, I actually have been cooking more at home since the pandemic. Um, surprisingly, I guess it, it was kind of a weird year where I feel like many of you can relate where it felt like time was passing so slow, yet we were all so busy. Um, I think just adjusting to the change. So I think all kinds of comfort foods were what my husband and I were craving a lot. So one thing that I love to cook and that we cooked quite often was actually fried rice. Uh, we mm -hmm. have an actual wok in our kitchen, and now my new house has a, a wok burner as well on the stove, so we can truly use the wok to its full capacity. And what I love about fried rice is it's one of those dishes where you can throw anything into it, like all sorts of leftovers, um, egg, different vegetables that you just have in your produce bin, and then you throw it all together, and then it makes a pretty tasty meal. I love that it's simple. You can eat it in one bowl with one spoon. Um, and it tastes great as leftovers as well. So for me, uh, what I've really enjoyed cooking because I enjoy eating it during the pandemic is fried rice. Are there any secret, you know, power ingredients that you throw in that most people wouldn't expect into your fried rice? <laughs> hmm. I mean, I, I would say I, yeah, maybe I would say maybe ketchup. I think that's a, huh. I think it's like a Vietnamese thing mm. where it's kind of a French influence as well, where the ketchup brings like not only color to the fried rice, but a little bit of that sweetness and tang. So mm. I do add ketchup uh, to my fried rice. That's a fun thing. I think I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm Canadian and we love ketchup. We even have ketchup chips back in my, my original home country. <laughs> so I, anytime there's a reason or excuse to put ketchup in, I, I lather, you know, my plate <laughs> with it. So um, I want to talk about, you know, how amazing your life journey has been thus far. And, you know, the theme of our Asian Pacific American Heritage Month this year is centered around resilience, which I think so many aspects of your life have, you know, embodied 
embody this. Um, so I'd actually love to open up today's conversation for our audience to get to know a little bit more about you um, and your family's genesis story in America. You know, how did your parents come to the U.S. and what was it like growing up as a daughter of Vietnamese refugees? Well, my parents were refugees, like we talked about. Uh, in 1975, they left uh, Saigon, now Ho Chi Minh City. They left a couple days before the fall of Saigon uh, at the end of April in 1975. They actually escaped on a U.S. naval ship and were kind of floating at sea for a while because the engines had broken down on the ship. And then eventually they made it to the Philippines, where they were then flown to Guam and they were in a refugee camp. And then my parents were sponsored by a church in Pennsylvania. So they moved to Pennsylvania. Uh, and so they were kind of living up there. Uh, they also lived in Chicago where they found that it was very, very cold and, and being from <laughs> Vietnam, they weren't used to that sort of climate. So eventually my parents made their way to Southern California where the climate is amazing. And then that's where I was born. Um, so I was born in LA and pretty much raised in Houston, Texas. Um, still live here now, you know, I, a little bit of, you know, I have lived a little bit in Southern California. I went to my undergraduate uh, in Austin, uh, but my graduate degree I got in Houston and I've lived most of my life here in Houston. And so that's kind of the genesis story of uh, my parents and their, their immigration here to the U.S. That's an absolutely phenomenal story. Um, definitely seems like resilience is a part of your DNA, you know, the type of journey your parents had to take with the fall of Saigon. Mm -hmm. um, and I also want to talk about another part that, you know, has been a huge example of your resilience. You were diagnosed with an autoimmune condition, neuromyelitis optica, in your early 20s. Um, mm -hmm. And for those of us who may not be familiar on this conversation right now, it's a condition that damages the spinal cord and your eye nerves. Um, and you became completely blind in 2007. Now, I can't even begin to imagine how, you know, utterly terrifying and, you know, maybe unfair, you know, it must have felt like to go through this. Um, so my question to you is, like, how did you manage from, you know, a physical and mental health perspective? And what advice might you have for those who are going through life changing health diagnoses? Uh, yeah, that was definitely a tough time in my life. Um, you know, I think when I, it was around the same time when I was actually teaching myself how to cook. Um, that I started losing my vision. And so it manifested first in the symptom of um, inflammation of one of my optic nerves. So my vision went blurry and I thought it was my contact lens because I wore contact lenses at the time and I, you know, I changed it out and it was still blurry. So I went to see an optometrist and they ran all the tests, said that it was actually something neurological. So then I had to go see a neuro-ophthalmologist. And by now, you know, I was, it's in my early twenties, I was still in school. Um, doing my undergraduate degree. And they initially misdiagnosed me with MS. And so they put me on MS treatment. Um, I did have very similar symptoms to MS because NMO or neuromyelitis optica, that's NMO for short, um, is very similar to MS where your immune system is attacking your neurological system. So my optic nerves would always become inflamed and that would cause the haziness in my vision or my vision to decrease and it also affected my spinal cord. So sometimes I would feel tingliness in my fingers and my toes. Um, then it would gradually get worse. Uh, and then it would feel as though like, imagine your foot or your leg was asleep, but no matter what you do, like you can't get that feeling back into your foot. And then eventually there was a time when I had my most serious flare up where I became paralyzed from the neck down um, so obviously I wow. couldn't sit up by myself, mm -hmm. couldn't walk, couldn't feed myself, go use the restroom. And at the same time, I was, uh, dealing with the vision loss as well. So, um, you know, it was definitely a tough time, but fortunately, you know, four years after the misdiagnosis, I was correctly diagnosed and they got me on a regimen that, uh, was a better treatment for my NMO. And I've been, uh, pretty much flare up free for, uh, I want to say almost 15 years now. Um, so that, you know, Congratulations. My, thank you. My spinal cord inflammation, I've been able to recover quite well from, uh, but my optic nerve inflammations or my optic neuritis, like that was much harder. So, you know, gradually in my twenties, I, my vision did decrease the level that it is now. Um, many people think that blindness is like a black or white thing, but it's really kind of a spectrum. So I do see a little bit, um, I see like some shadow and some light um, and everything's very hazy. I often compare it to uh, 
I, I say, imagine if you were getting out of a really hot shower and you looked into that steamy mirror, that's kind of the mm -hmm. vision that I see all the time. But I think in dealing with that, you know, it, I've learned that I can feel sorry for myself and, and whatnot and go through the whole grieving process because it is a loss that I, I had to grieve, right? It's the loss of my vision, the loss of some independence. So it's okay to go through those emotions. And I think it's important to go through those emotions. But at some point I learned and realized that the world keeps on moving on regardless of whether I decide to participate in it or not. So I knew that eventually I had to kind of stop feeling sorry for myself and put, you know, literally one foot in front of the other and try to mm -hmm. figure it out and figure out, okay, what's my new purpose in life with these limitations? Um, what am I really meant to do? Um, and so I think it really helped to think in that sort of perspective and have a good attitude, have a good sense of humor. Um, sometimes it was hard, but uh, I have a pretty good sense of humor and it's always better to be able to laugh at yourself and make jokes about things that are happening because sometimes humor is really what helps us through those really dark times. And of course, um, what helped me most was just my community and my friends and family. Um, they may not understand exactly what I was going through, but the fact that I knew they were trying their best to help me and be there for me um, and not necessarily like try to fix things, but just kind of be there in my misery with me when I was feeling upset, mm -hmm. that really helped as well. Well, I mean, it's, it's been some time since 2007, but so much has happened for you, you know, so many happening things, <laughs> you know, restaurants, uh, books, you know, winner of uh, Master Chef. I mean, you really took, you know, everything in stride and tried to make the best of it. And, you know, I'm curious as someone who, you know, has seen the world and, and now lives with the loss of vision, you're clear, clearly a creative, right? You were in that MFA program, um, you loved cooking. You know, how has this experience affected the way that you visualize the world, you know, in your imagination and, and in your cooking? Well, I, I find that, yes, I am a, a very creative person. Um, my undergraduate degree is actually in business. So I, I am also using that side of my brain mm -hmm. as well. And I think that has served me well because I use a lot of the skills that I learned in business school towards opening restaurants, towards being an entrepreneur, towards learning how to communicate with people in this world. Um, but at the same time, I think where my gut is, is definitely creativity. Um, and I find that the two things that the arts that I love, whether it's the culinary arts or the literary arts, they, what they have in common is that it's a form of self-expression and trying to relate and communicate with other people. So I've found that these things help me connect with other people. And I think that's the most important thing in life is human relationships, the relationships you form with you know, other family members, friends, people that you meet on the road, people that come to your business, uh, that frequent your business, um, people that you meet at events like this. I think these sorts of relationships um, are really and truly what life is about. And I feel like cooking and writing are the vehicles that help me make these connections. So when I write a story or an, um, a memoir essay, for example, or someone reads like my future memoir, or when I cook a meal and share it with them, something that I grew up eating, this is a way for other people to start to understand me and for me to show that I, you know, want to make a connection with other people. So I think, you know, that's kind of the, the purpose of creativity. And that's, I've, I've found that through my health issues and my vision loss, that's what it helped me find my true purpose, which is to continue to formulate these sort of human uh, relationships and mm -hmm. connect people and show that everyone in this world, we're all much more alike than we are different. That's so beautifully put. <laughs> I, I love it. Um, and, and it's so true. I think especially in this past year, um, you know, I've missed being around a table and eating with people because, you know, food is something that, you know, I, I've always viewed as being also Vietnamese um, in my ethnic background, uh, it, it's viewed as a form of care, right? Like, have you eaten yet? What have you eaten today? You know, the whole huge table spread when, when you meet with uh, friends or family. Um, so I find it beautiful that you took up writing as a way to express and also cooking because um, they're things that bring people together for conversation and, you know, for the exchange of ideas. Um, and speaking of relationships, I, I want to talk about one that, you know, I know was... Uh, 
a huge impact in your life. And it was your mom, right? Mm -hmm. And you lost your mom very early at you know, the tender age of, of 14. And with her passing also went many of the foods that you grew up with and, and that she cooked for you. Um, how do you recommend that most families think about preserving their, you know, their secret family recipes or, or you know, those special meals, that, you know, meatballs or um, may it be like a pho recipe, you know, for, for generations to come? Yeah, you know, my initial instinct as a cookbook author is to say, write these recipes down. <laughs> but I know like grandmas and my mom, like none of them cooked in that way. Mm -hmm. My aunts, like, you know, they don't write things down. They may jot down a few ratios, but they don't write recipes the way you would read in a cookbook. So I think really to preserve family recipes or um, certain ethnic cuisines and dishes that you value through your uh, from your ancestors, it really is to teach the next generation and teach people around you how to cook it. So whether it's your children, your grandchildren, cousins, friends that are interested, I think you learn much more by using your own hands and by doing rather than reading. So it's it's really about experiencing the cooking process itself. So I would say get in the kitchen together, cook together. And then the more you do it, the more you understand the recipe and what works. And you may also make eventually make it your own and tweak it in certain ways. Like if you like certain ingredients or you like it saltier or sweeter, you can kind of adjust the ratios of the ingredients and, and eventually make the dish your own. And then that is a beautiful thing in itself because, you know, we always talk about the authenticity of food, but what does that really mean? Because, you know, what I thought my mom was cooking as authentic wasn't as authentic as perhaps her mom cooked in Vietnam mm -hmm. because when she came here to the U.S., she didn't have access to certain ingredients that were either too expensive or just not available here in the U.S. So she had to make do by substituting certain ingredients. And so then, you know, that's what I grew up eating and I thought it was authentic, but it, you know, it, you ask my mom's mom, that probably wasn't considered authentic in her eyes. Mm -hmm. And then now, you know, I, I do certain Vietnamese dishes that, you know, I would never want to ever claim that it's authentic because as long as a dish you cook is authentic to you and your own sensibility, then I think that's what matters. And and at the end of the day, as long as it's delicious and, and you enjoy it, then that's, that's what's most important with food. This is great advice. Um, it's funny because I've always told her, open a YouTube channel, you would have so many fans, like write this all down. And you're right, I think it's just not really a part of the culture to really write all these, you know, quarts down, this is how many cups you need. Um, it's a little bit, I guess, uh, tedious, you know, to, to do so. That's why I suggested the YouTube channel, because then I'm like, you just don't have to write anything down, just show me how you make it. And I, I want, I'm curious to know, is there a special dish that you wish you had learned from her? Definitely her beef pho, so the beef noodle soup. Um, it's the quintessential dish of Vietnam. And she actually, uh, from what my dad tells me, she learned her recipe uh, from a former chef in Vietnam that owned a pho restaurant. Hmm. And she cooked that dish very well. And I know it sounds so you know, commonplace to say, oh, my mom's pho was the best pho. But of course, like, I have that nostalgia in me of, that I will say my mom's pho was the best pho. Um, it's a laborious process. So it would only happen on the weekends and not every weekend at that. Um, and then now that she's gone and didn't leave any recipes or teach me how to cook, I that is like the one dish I really miss of hers that I, I really wish I learned. And my dad did tell me that she had a list of the ingredients jotted down somewhere, mm -hmm. but he lost that piece of paper um, after she passed away. So we have no idea what, you know, what she really did or used or whatever for her fuss. So I can only now try to recreate it over and over by, by memory of like, and by taste and trying to get it very similar to how I remember her pho tasting. I think it's amazing that you've reverse engineered so many of her recipes. I've read in a lot of the you know interviews that you've given that um, that's kind of how you learn cooking. You bought an Asian cookbook, you, you bought a set of knives, pots and pans, and you started going at it. And because, you know, um, you lost your mom so early, you know, she didn't leave, you know, the the detailed recipes behind for you. Um, and I guess for all those who are watching who may be like second generation or, or third generation, you know, um, children of, you know, immigrants, I, I think this is kind of inspirational. Like you kind of have to get in there and do it. Otherwise there might be, you know, loss of information that, that shares. And even if you evolve that recipe, like you have chosen to, and many others will, it's still authentic to the family and, and where you come from. Um, which you know leads me to my next question. Um, I was watching an interview 
where you shared that well growing up. You know, many of your classmates uh, at school thought that your homemade Vietnamese food was like stinky or smelly, right? And I had always wished that I could get Lunchables for lunch because I'm like, those are so cool. You know, they're they're in vogue. But I always had like a bun mi or some very nice like homemade uh, meal. But, you know, Vietnamese food, when it's fermented, sometimes it can have a very strong smell. Um, I find it interesting because, you know, 20 years later, you know, 20 something years later, <laughs> Vietnamese food is definitely all the rage. Um, and so what are your thoughts about, you know, where the economics and, and status of cuisines like Mexican and Vietnamese are, are headed in today's culture? Well, I think it's because the progress of America of, you know, there's so many people who've immigrated here to America from other countries, bringing along with them their recipes, their family's recipes and their ancestors' recipes. And the fact that we are able to get all sorts of cuisines in the U.S. Um, you know, I know you're in New York, I'm in Houston. There, yet we can get so many things, whether it's Mexican, Vietnamese, mm -hmm. Chinese, uh, Ethiopian, um, all sorts of great cuisines. And I, I feel like that sort of availability allows us to expand, I think, our horizon and our minds to get to know other cultures through the foods that they eat. Um, but yes, I mean, I had growing up, I had what they say is like that lunchbox moment where you open up your your lunch pail <laughs> and you pull out something that you love to eat. You know, whether for me it was like egg rolls or like braised pork belly or whatever, but it wasn't the cool thing like that, it, you know, trendy and delicious that people accept now. But I was so desperate to trade my food for my friends like bologna and cheese sandwiches or <laughs> peanut butter jelly sandwiches and chips. Um, and I think it's because I grew up also just in the era, and many of us feel this even to this day, um, of fitting in. And I think because my parents were, you know, fairly fresh immigrants, and I was born in the U.S., I was sort of straddling these two different cultures that I was trying to reconcile. And it was something that was a challenge for me because, at, for example, at home, I was only allowed to speak Vietnamese because my mom wanted me to preserve um, the language that my, you know, of my family. And then at school, of course, I'm speaking English. You know, at home, I'm eating Vietnamese food. At school, I, I wanted to eat pizza and burgers. So it was, you know, this sort of trying to reconcile these two different cultures that are part of me. That was a struggle for me when I was growing up. But now I think, you know, with maturity and with age and with um, being able to accept who I am, what, you know, being an Asian American woman uh, with a vision impairment, um, being able to more fully accept who I am and as my identity, I'm actually very happy that I'm able to know both cultures. I feel like my, uh, I don't know, I think my life experience is much more rich in, in knowing more than one language, more than one cuisine, um, and being able to eat all sorts of cuisines as well. So, um, yeah, I would say, I think now it's just, um, I think it's beautiful to be able to live in a place where I can eat all sorts of cuisines and hear all different kinds of languages when I walk down the street and just get to know people from other countries side by side living here in, in Houston and, and um, yeah, just getting to know other people and through, through their cultures and through their foods and, and not have to travel, especially during the pandemic, like we've all been kind of locked down at home. And what I love about traveling is getting to know other cultures, but you know, since we've been kind of locked down, at least I can eat tacos one day, eat pho another day, you know, eat dim sum <laughs> the third day. So that's the beauty of it. Thanks for sharing all of those great insights. And yes, I, I don't ever long for a bologna sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> if anything, I, I long for the days where I could get those amazing egg rolls like after school for my mom. And it's, you know, Vietnamese food is an intensive process, right? Mm -hmm. Like that bowl of pho that you were talking about People don't realize that behind the scenes, there's been this massive pot that has been going on for hours at a time. You know, if um, you know all sorts of spices, the, the beef is there. It, it takes a long time to to put together something. Mm -hmm. So, I'm also curious, <clears throat> just out of curiosity, um, do you think there's ever going to be a day when like Vietnamese food um, is going to be priced, you know, a little bit higher in the sense of like, you know, I think it's very acceptable in New York City for a lot of people um, to think that like Italian or French food should be priced at like, let's say, uh, I don't know, 
30 dollars let's say for an entree but if you were to go to a vietnamese restaurant and see that some people might be sticker shocked or be like why is this type of food so expensive even though i personally think that the the taste and the flavors and the process of making it is quite intensive too um what are your thoughts about that as you know a chef and a, as someone who's also business minded yeah that's actually a great topic that my chef friends and people in the industry have been debating about quite often um I think that it's it's going to be a slow process, but I'm hoping to be part of that movement to get Vietnamese food to be recognized as that. And that's what we discuss all the time is that, you know, yes, French food, Italian food, Japanese food, certain foods, like we have this mindset where we're okay paying a lot of money for, but when you get like Vietnamese food, it's supposed to be this humble food that's not a lot of money. And why is that? Um, and I think the strange thing is that both, so both of my restaurants um, in, in Houston, I have, we have tons of like great mom and pop authentic Vietnamese food, mm -hmm. like selling bang me or the sandwiches, the noodle soups, the rice plates that I'm not trying. That's like kind of my parents' generation of restaurant owners. I'm this second generation Vietnamese American trying to push the boundaries of what Vietnamese food can be. So I'm not really locating my restaurants in the center of Asia town. I'm more kind of in the center of the city. The ambiance is different. The music is different. We have full bar um, at the second restaurant, Sin Chao. Um, and I'm trying to also infuse a lot of the other parts of me in cuisine into the Vietnamese um dishes that we serve so mm -hmm. for example at sin Chao, you know as a texan we eat a lot of barbecue that's you know <laughs> texas is known for beef barbecue so we actually smoke some of our own beef at sin Chao, and then we put that in some of our vietnamese dishes um and so i think what i'm trying to do is push the boundary of what vietnamese food can be and can cost and mm -hmm. what i have learned opening up two vietnamese restaurants is that vietnamese food is very very laborious there's a lot of prep mm -hmm. and a lot of different components that go into it so why is it that vietnamese food is cheaper um, and i think it's just really the society mindset that we have about vietnamese food and the crazy thing is sometimes it's it's a lot of the Vietnamese people that come to eat at my restaurants that complain about the price point. <laughs> and I'm like, do you, uh, you know, you're not exactly my target market, but I say you should want me to push the boundary of Vietnamese cuisine and what it can be that Vietnamese food doesn't have to be this secondary, you know, cheaper food in cuisine. It should be just as good, you know, and accepted as the other cuisines that we think of that we were willing to pay top dollar for. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my mentality is like you, you know, I'm trying to get Vietnamese food to be viewed differently. Um, and so it's not really doing us a service as a, as a Vietnamese community, if people are coming and saying, Oh, I can get the same thing like on Bel Air and you know, for like, $5 or whatever. And yes, you totally can. And it's totally fine. Sometimes there's a day and place and time for that. But if you're in the city, you have to understand like, you know, we're paying our um, staff like fair wages. We're um, using better ingredients, you know, like organic or non, um, uh, non GMO, whatever. Mm -hmm. So these, and the rent is going to be higher obviously in the city. So all of these things do factor into what the cost of the dish will be. And I think a lot of people who don't own restaurants don't necessarily understand that. So for me, I'm always about trying to be transparent and being vocal about what it is, is my mission for Vietnamese food. So I think it will maybe eventually get there, but it will take a long time. And we need to, I think we need to change the mindset of people viewing Vietnamese food a certain way. And that includes like our parents' generation. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think this is a really eloquent way of um, answering this question because I feel like, you know, your generation and the coming generations of, of people who are opening restaurants and bakeries, are trying to value their work more, you know, in, in terms of like, you know, can I make a decent living out of this or currency? Like, you know, all those things kind of matter, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I agree. I think, you know, <laughs> my mom is on this live stream, but she, I've taken her to some very nice upscale Vietnamese restaurants before. And sometimes she looks at the menu and she's like, excuse me, how much is this price? But I think in the back of my mind, 
And like, I've seen you make this and I know how long, you know, how many hours goes into you making this. So this is actually a fair price, you know, for, for the amount of labor, you know, that actually goes into the, the detailing, um, the food prep, you know, waiting for something to finally be ready. So I hope that you can, you know, start this movement <laughs> for for the culture, because I think it would be very, um, it's kind of necessary, I think, in the coming times. And also as, you know, Vietnamese Americans um, and Vietnam at large um, starts expanding and growing their economic presence, there's going to be, I think, a demand for for places that you can entertain in and, and you know, mm -hmm. try new different types of dishes. Um, so, you know, I think you have many areas of renown for you coming in life, but one of the biggest areas of renown that I think you're known for is being the first ever, you know, blind contestant and master chef during season three. And for those who don't know on this, um, you know, show right now, you defeated over 30,000 amateur home chefs to take home the title of master chef. You know, 30,000 is no mere number. That's quite a few people who actually, most I'm sure who actually have, you know, no obstacles in their way. Um, and Gordon Ramsay, of course, is one of the judges there and he does not mince his words. And I think he was one of your biggest fans. Like, tell me more about what it was like to be in the competition and like, you know, reflecting back upon it now, you know, do you have any thoughts? The competition was definitely tough. Uh, people often ask the question, like, is it really true when you, they say you have 60 minutes for a challenge, you really only get 60 minutes? Yes, we only get the amount of time they say. Um, I, I think it's definitely for me, I'm very competitive. So I, you know, but I also, I, I think I, I stress out very easily. So for me, I was always on like this heightened, like alertness when I was filming. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's stressful because every day you wake up, you're not really sure what's going to happen. You don't know what challenge you're going to come across. You don't know, who, you know, and I became friends with everyone mm -hmm. on my season, all the other contestants. So we, you know, we bonded and it was like, we don't know who's going to go home that day, who, you know, so it was, it's very stressful. Um, looking back at it though, I think initially, and in, if you've watched my season, you sort of see my pro progression from a lot, having a lot of self doubt to kind mm -hmm. of coming into my own and being proud of the dishes that I serve. And, and, and that was definitely a true narrative arc for what happened to me on my season. And it was, you know, at that time in my life, I was in my last uh, semester of grad school when I decided to audition for MasterChef as if I didn't have enough going on. But, um, <laughs> you know, my friends and my family encouraged mm -hmm. me to try out because they said, you know, in spite of your vision impairment, you are a great cook. I think they were said, you know, America needs to know that this is how someone with a vision impairment can still manage the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And in my head, I was just thinking, well, as a person, as an artist or someone who's, you know, writing, I just wanted to experience it and I figured I would go to audition and then get kicked off and then go home and then have a story to write about. So for me, it was like a selfish reason where I thought I would just come up with ideas to be able to, you know, come home and like have a story or an essay or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that was really my purpose. So when I went, you know, I took this like short leave from my semester and I was like, I told my professor, I was just like, oh, don't worry, I'll be back in two weeks. I packed like a small suitcase thinking <laughs> like I wouldn't be there for that long. And so um, you know, I, I really didn't go for the intention of like going as far as I did, but of course I am competitive, but, you know, I was going through grad school. Um, my, like I was saying, my undergraduate degree was in business and I was, I did a complete career change after I lost my vision and my health, you know, changed. And so I went into the creative side, which I never studied any literature before formally. So when I was in school, I also and this was also around the time when I was dealing with the new level of vision loss. So I was learning to use a white cane. I was learning how to read mm -hmm. Braille. There were so many new things in my life that I, even being in grad school, I felt uh, out of my comfort zone. So I was dealing with a lot of self-confidence and self-doubt, uh, I think, at that time. And then going on a show like this and everyone on there talks about food, they know so much about food. I was just thinking in my head, I was like, well, I love to cook, but I don't think I'm that knowledgeable, but I love to learn and I want to learn. So I, I took it so that I was going to be on MasterChef and learn as much as I can with every challenge and how do I become a better cook? So you sort of see that progression, you know, as for example, my apple pie moment, when I served mm -hmm. up a pie that, you know, I was very inexperienced at baking, but Gordon said it actually turned out really good. 
Um, and then, it's perfect flakiness. <laughs> yeah. No soggy bottoms. <laughs> yeah, and I think you know the the message that Gordon gave me during that challenge is something that I take with me to this day in everything I do. And he, you know, what he said is like, stop doubting yourself, start believing in yourself, and be bold. And I really take that advice to heart. And then as the challenges went on, I started noticing that my vision impairment was actually an advantage. And because I noticed that the people who could see, I felt like sometimes they would look at what their the other contestants were cooking and then they would second mm. guess what they're cooking because they're like, oh my gosh, that person's using like a really fancy technique or very high end ingredients. Their dish is going to taste better than mine. I need to change up what I'm going to cook. But for me, I never knew what anyone else was cooking, right? Like I can only <laughs> concentrate on what I was doing at my own kitchen station. So I think that actually eventually became an advantage because I only focused on what I was doing and focused on being a better cook today than I was the day before in the Master Chef kitchen. So I wasn't really psyching myself out, wondering what other people were cooking or like, you know, seeing what they're doing and then changing up my plan last mm -hmm. minute and then ending up not being able to finish a dish it within a certain amount of time. So for me, I think it allowed me to concentrate and focus more on improving my own culinary skills. And I think that's eventually kind of like that slow and steady race was how I ended up winning, I think. And that was my advantage. Absolutely phenomenal, Christine. And, you know, I, I know you mentioned self-doubt and that, yeah, I, I could see some of that in the earlier episodes, but I'd also say, I also saw someone who was quite daring and risk-taking, right? Because look, most people don't even think about joining the audition, right? And so the fact that you took that step and, and went in for the audition, even though you were like, I don't know if this is going to go anywhere, you know, somewhere deep down inside, there was someone who was a, a believer, you know, and all of that kind of led you to becoming this huge trailblazer, you know, a huge advocate. Um, and also, I think, role model for, for so many different types of communities, you know, communities of disabilities, the, the Asian American community, the Vietnamese community, like, I think my my family definitely read about you in some Vietnamese newspaper, you know, that gets distributed around the community. Um, so I want to thank you for, you know, taking those those steps. And, you know, even if it feels scary, um, someone out there is watching and, and continuously inspired by you. Um, and we're almost at time. So I have just one last question for you before we go into Q&A. My question is, you're speaking to a Google audience today, right? And our mission is to, to build for everyone. And to the teams that design, build, and engage with users, do you have any thoughts about how we can build, you know, better inclusion-minded products? You know, any dream products or problems that you wish to be solved when you're using, you know, the internet or Google at large? Yeah, I mean, I think about this on a daily basis because I use Google on a daily basis. <laughs> um, I'm very much an advocate for. Uh, inclusive and universal design. So I've been speaking about this for almost a decade now. Um, but, you know, I, I feel like it's important to design a world, not just necessarily in software or hardware or kitchen equipment or furniture or houses, but um, all these things, I think the world needs to be designed so that it is inclusive because, you know, I've spoken about this in a TEDx talk before is that as people, we're all aging, so we're all moving towards, you know, as harsh as it may sound, mm -hmm. towards, you know, perhaps becoming disabled. Um, mm -hmm. Our abilities will be limited with age. Um, you know, our parents are getting older, we're getting mm -hmm. older. We mm -hmm. sure, you know, we have friends who could maybe go through things and then um, start having certain limitations. So it's important to design a world where it's ready for us uh, mm -hmm. when we get to that point. And I think to take it even further back in order to do that, I think you have to have diverse and inclusive teams mm -hmm. um, because then that brings together all different types of minds and patterns of thinking into one setting where you can discuss and collaborate ideas. And I think that helps with pushing the envelope on how you can make inclusive and universal design something very real and tangible. And that goes back to making sure the people you work with are not as similar to you as, mm -hmm. you know, perhaps you'd like. And yes, you know, working with people who are different from us or come from a different background or different um, generation or whatever, it is challenging. But I think in these challenges, I always say that with the biggest challenges come the greatest rewards. 
And if you can look past those differences and see the similarities, like I said before, we're all human. We all desire mm -hmm. to be loved, to be understood and to be respected and to live with dignity. And I think to live with dignity, you have to kind of live in a world where it's inclusive. Um, so I think working with people who are different from you will challenge you to think outside the box uh, and push you in a direction that maybe you're uncomfortable with. But if you keep getting pushed out of your comfort zone, you eventually um, grow to uh, adapt and to love mm -hmm. it as well. And I think that's mm -hmm. what's important in how to um, have inclusive design um, is to work with people who are not like you in, in mind and body. Thank you, Christine. I hope whoever's watching today or listening today um, will take this to heart and Again, you know, I, I, you know, a lot of the world now happens digitally, so we need to consider, you know, better inclusive digital design beyond just, you know, like what you mentioned, homes, cars, etc. Um, so with that, um, for all those who might be interested in supporting Christine, I, I know she's also doing some live stream cooking, and uh, for those in the Houston area or Houston offices, we also have the opportunity to go pick up some meal kits from her that you can then cook at home. Um, she can maybe do a little uh, plug at the end, but I know we have a lot of eager Q&As. <laughs> so I'm going to move to that section right now. Um, Sophia, feel free to put the questions on. Okay, we're starting with Adeline Yo. Growing up, my parents' cooking and dinnertime stories have been formative to the person I am. What are some of your favorite memories of food and family, and how has that shaped the way that you cook? Well, I, I wasn't in the kitchen growing up a lot. My mom was actually very overprotective. I was an only child growing up, so my mom wouldn't let me near the hot stove or a knife. Mm -hmm. But what I did love to do was, was she would let me help her with the small things. So uh, one of my most fond memories from childhood is when she would make jaya or Vietnamese uh, egg rolls. Mm -hmm. And she, they were, you know, a laborious food to make. So she would only make them for special occasions, whether it was Lunar New Year, or maybe I had international festival at school <laughs> yes. um, and I had to bring food um, <laughs> or my birthday parties, she would make them. And so I, she would let me kind of mix the filling. And then she eventually taught me how to roll and wrap the egg rolls. Um, and then also fast forward to when I was older and my mom had passed away and I was living with my family uh, in Southern California and I was, my grandparents lived with us. This is my dad's parents. And um, every Lunar New Year, my grandma would make bang chung um, or the Vietnamese like square rice cakes um, that you wrap in banana leaves. And it's, uh, it's like a sticky rice cake and inside it's filled with pork and mung bean paste. And then it gets steamed and it's like, you know, very much a traditional Lunar New Year uh, food item that we always ate. And my grandma would always make, she would set up kind of an assembly line with my aunts. And then, you know, if my cousins and I ever wanted to help, we would, um, you know, get into the assembly line and, and help her like wrap the and prepare these bang zheng. And mm -hmm. she would make dozens of them and then they would be given away as gifts to our family and everyone that came to visit, you know, our family during the Lunar New Year celebration. So my fondest memories, I think, are just these uh, times of being in the kitchen with my family and, you know, just the small talk that comes of it or just the aromas that come from the food that we're making. Um, just being in the presence, I think, of my family and the generations before me just by doing the things that, you know, my ancestors did and making these same dishes. Um, those are probably my fondest memories is because the kitchen, you know, even though I didn't feel like I contributed much when I was younger, like it was still a, a place of bonding and a place to get to know my family better. Thank you for sharing those stories. Definitely takes me back to my own childhood. Every time I brought those uh, egg rolls to a school event or, you know, a school potluck, it was always the first dish to go. Like very easily. Yeah, I don't know if it was the same experience for you, but yeah. um, I, I think about those moments fondly. And uh, our next question is going to be from Annika Ariel. Hi, Christine. I'm also legally blind, and I remember watching your season of MasterChef a few years ago, and it was so cool. What's your best tip for other blind cooks? Hmm. Uh, you know, organization, I think, is key. I think that's for anyone, whether it's sighted or visually impaired, but much more important when you're visually impaired. Um, organization is definitely key. So um, for example, I have my spice drawer all alphabetized. And what I do is I use my uh, a 
grocery app that's on my smartphone and I actually have a list, you know, instead of using it just for a grocery list, I have on there also a pantry inventory list. Mm -hmm. And on it, I, I list out everything I have in my kitchen, whether it's in my fridge, my freezer, my pantry, my spice drawer, um, my dried goods, canned goods, anything. So that when I meal plan or when I have to make a shopping list to go to the store, I can review the list with the screen reader that's built into my smartphone and realize, okay, I have some steaks frozen so I can make a steak dinner, but you know, maybe I need some broccolini as a side to eat with a steak. So I'll add broccolini to my grocery list. And so that's really how I meal plan. And then my spice drawer, you know, I list all my spices and they're alphabetized. So I can scroll through the spice section and, and then count by the spices in my spice drawer and locate the right spice. And then of course, like just verify by smelling it. Um, but yeah, I just say organization. I say take advantage of technology. Um, if you have a smartphone or a, um, a smart tablet, then use you know apps that are accessible mm -hmm. with screen readers to help you be more organized and stay on top of everything that's in your kitchen. Great tips. I'm sure Annika uh, will appreciate that quite a bit. Thanks for sharing, Christine. And our next question comes from Jenny Liu. Hi, Christine. I'm used to my mom using the same three kitchen tools in the kitchen for almost every dish, wok, chopsticks, and wooden spatula. What are your recommendations for must-have kitchen tools? Hmm. Okay, so my first thing is a very inexpensive item called a bench scraper. Uh, it's also uh, called a dough cutter, but what it is, it's like, um, it's like a, a little... You can be made of plastic. Mine is made of metal. And all it is is like just this rectangular piece of metal and it has a handle. And I use that as a visually impaired person when I cook. I mean, when I chop things on my cutting board, like things get go every which way. But I can use this to scrape the cutting board and gather everything up and in, in, onto the blade and then just easily throw it into the pot or into a bowl. Um, it's also very handy in cleaning your counter if you're you've been baking and you have like dough or, um, you know, stuck to your counter, you can use that to scrape off the dough um, and gather everything on your counter to clean it. So it's called a bench scraper. It's like less than 10 bucks. Um, that's, I think a must have tool. Um, I, you know, a wok is not a must have, but I do love having a wok. Like if you love to cook, that's definitely some, you can do so many things with a wok. You can deep fry, shallow fry, mm -hmm. pan fry, stir fry steam in it as well. So, um, you know, that's really important. I say a pressure cooker is a must have, you know, everyone's been kind of following the rage of the instant pot. I actually never used a pressure cooker until I was on MasterChef. And that's when I came across one in the pantry and I was like, I need to learn how to use this thing. And the beauty of the pressure cooker is, um, it can cook all of your long braising, um, stews or d types of dishes in about a third of the time. So if there's a recipe that says you need to braise this pork shoulder for uh, three hours, you can cook it in the pressure cooker uh, on high pressure for one hour and it should come out the same tenderness. Um, so I think a pressure cooker is a also a must have that helps you save time. So I would say those are probably the three things I can think of off the top of my head. I will have to go get a bench scraper for my apartment in New York. I actually, this is the first time I'm hearing of it. I think I've seen it before, um, but thanks for the tip. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, Jenny also appreciates too. And our next question is going to be from Harshal Ved, who actually works on the accessibility team here at Google. I am legally blind and I cook a few dishes and stick to it. Do you have any advice for me that will help me pick up my cooking game to the next level? For example, accessible ways of learning and logistics. He actually wanted me to also mention this is because he wants to cook better food for his wife. So if you have any tips uh, for him, I think it would make his day. Uh, so I think, I think one, you know, what we talked about earlier is kind of don't be afraid to step out of your comfort zone and embrace the mistakes you make in the kitchen. I mean, even to this day, I do a lot of uh, research and development in my own home kitchen. So there's oftentimes I'm cooking a dish that I've never made before. And sometimes those dishes don't turn out well. So even someone like me who's won a, a culinary show on, on TV can still cook a bad dish once in a while. So I think if you get used to that idea that it's okay to sometimes once in a while, like cook something that's not great, um, embrace those mistakes and figure out, okay, well, next time, how would I make it better and learn from it? 
I think once you get out of that mentality of feeling like you have to limit yourself because every dish you cook has to be perfect. If you step away from thinking in that way, then I think you have more room to grow and you'll be more accepting of the mistakes you may make in the kitchen and then you'll be more likely to experiment. So I would say one is like change that sort of attitude, um, experiment without the fear of failure. That's actually one of the core values at both of my restaurants um, is, you know, we want to equip our, our team with the understanding that no idea is too crazy to try. You won't know unless you try. So mm -hmm. I would say experiment without the fear of failure. Um, and then, you know, I, I had the, the cooking show in Canada called Four Senses, and it's really, it's a cooking show that's geared towards the vision impaired. So if you go to, um, you know, if you Google Four Senses AMI, which was the accessible media network that it was on, um, my cooking show actually has built in audio description so you can follow along the recipes. I mean, um, you know, and the recipes are printed on the website, I believe as well. So you can find like different tips, cooking tips for vision impaired uh, home chefs on there as well. So I would use that as a resource. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think just first and foremost, just don't be afraid to, to make mistakes and try new things in the kitchen. And I think eventually you'll build your repertoire to many more dishes. Thank you, Christina. I'm sure Harshal appreciates it. And I'm sure he'll cook, he'll cook something amazing. I'll send you a picture. <laughs> and our next question, I think we have time for maybe three, three, three or four more. Um, Justin Eisenach, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Justin. Um, my great aunt is Japanese and I feel fortunate she taught me her traditions because she couldn't have kids. Someday I hope to have a wife and kids to pass this on to. What are you most excited to pass on? Oh. So I can answer this in two ways. I think in the more broad way when you say, what do I hope to pass on? I interpret it as kind of your question is, what do you want to be as your legacy? Um, so when I answer in this more nebulous way, I, I would want to say that what I hope to pass on is a sense of hope to the next generation, that regardless of whatever challenges you come across in life, that there is a way, and if there's a way, will, there's a way and you can get beyond that. It just may take some adaptation. Um, and then if I dial it back and answer your question more literally in terms of like a recipe or a food that I would hope to pass on to the next generation, uh, I think I would want to go with like one of my favorite Vietnamese noodle soups, which is Wumbo Hue, which is like the mm -hmm. spicy beef lemongrass noodle soup from the, Hue, the central region of Vietnam. Um, that's one of my famous, I mean, uh, my mo most favorite uh, Vietnamese noodle soups. And I feel like, um, you know, it's kind of opposite to what I was just saying, because I was saying the pressure cooker is so great because it can cut down your cooking time. But I feel like we also, you know, want to sometimes be artisans in what we do. And we want to learn the long way and how how much time and labor it does take to make a pot mm -hmm. of soup taste really good and to bring out all of that umami and savoriness from the bones that you're boiling for a long time. So for me, like that's, you know, I think a recipe I would want to pass on to the next generation is how to make bumbo fe from scratch. Um, and do it the long way, not in a pressure burger. <laughs> you know, but some, like you were saying earlier, the evolution of recipes, I mean, pressure cookers weren't really around, uh, you know, 50, 60 years ago, maybe when our grandmas were making this. So maybe this is your, your additional touch, but that's an amazing dish for all those who haven't had it. Bumba Hue is quite delicious. Um, and our next question comes from Dean Deng. How do you know when a dish you've created is authentic to you? Have you created anything before that you felt was not genuinely you? And what did you learn from those experiences? Ooh, um, let, let's break down that question. Can you ask the first part again, Michelle? This is a, yes, the first a loaded part. question. Yes, how do you know when a dish you've created is authentic to you? That's the first part. Mm -hmm. And then the second part, do you want me to read the second part or should we just stick with the first uh, part? Yeah, let me answer that part. So I think, what something else I actually learned being on MasterChef was to trust my gut and my my intuition, um, which is something I used to second guess all the time um, in my life. And I think it came with maturity and age and experience in life that I started trusting my intuition more. So when I cook a dish and I I really enjoy it and I feel proud of it, that's when I know mm -hmm. that it's authentic to me. Okay, second part of the question, Michelle. And the second part of the question is. 
Have you created anything before that you felt was not genuinely you? And what did you learn from those experiences? Yes. So this kind of ties in with the first part of the question. So immediately when I want to answer that question, I think of the challenge I actually had on MasterChef when I was given a beautiful salmon to cook. And mm -hmm. in my head, I knew like I love eating salmon raw, like as sushi or sashimi. Mm -hmm. um, I also like it smoked uh, or on a bagel. But I really am not just me personally. I'm not really a fan of cooked salmon. I think a lot of my experiences in the past with cooked salmon is that it's overcooked and it becomes very dry. Um, but in my head, when I was given this, sam this beautiful salmon to prepare for the judges, I was thinking, well, if I just cut it up and serve it raw, that's not really showing any technique, right? It's just me depending on the, the freshness of the mm -hmm. fish. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, okay, I have to cook the salmon. So I went against my instincts and I cooked it and I overcooked it. And it had, I think it had no color on it. And it was probably the worst dish I cooked on the show. Um, and I served it anyway, but in my gut, I was, I just knew that it was bad and I shouldn't have followed my, you know, I shouldn't have second guessed what I like to eat and cook the salmon. Mm -hmm. So I think what I learned from that is going back to what I said before is to listen to that voice, I think inside and learn to trust your intuition. And you know, when something in your gut is telling you, this is the way to go. And you can't really, no matter how you try to convince yourself, otherwise, it just keeps going back mm -hmm. to this one, um, you know, answer. I think that means you should go with that answer. All right. This is, um, good advice for all aspiring cooks, you know, go with what feels good when you're cooking. So <laughs> trust your gut with that. Um, I think we have room for only one or two more questions. Um, so our next question um, is going to be from Trang Pham. Have you ever been back to Vietnam? And if yes, what do you think about the local restaurants in general? Yes, I have been back to Vietnam quite often, especially in the last several years. Um, well, before the pandemic, I had a lot of work there. Like I filmed MasterChef Vietnam. Um, I did some other um, endorsements that you know required me to go back to Vietnam. I still have family there as well. So I've been back quite a bit. Um, I love going back to Vietnam. I love eating all the food there. Um, I always learn something new about food when I go back to Vietnam. Like I thought I knew a lot about food, but every time I go back, there's an, a dish that I've never heard of or tried before. So for me, I also utilize my trips back to Vietnam as a lot of learning opportunity and, and R&D for future dishes that I may want to serve or introduce to people in Houston at my restaurants. So I just love eating everything and just trying all sorts of foods um, in Vietnam from all the different regions as well. So um, that, yeah, that's one of my most enjoyable pastimes, I think, visiting Vietnam. And I do miss the country a lot. And I'm Super excited to go back the next time I can um, get on a plane and fly internationally once the, this pandemic is a little bit more under control. <laughs> Absolutely. I think we all hope and dream of a day when, you know, the world kind of resumes back to whatever normal will look like after 2021. Um, so with that, that was our last question, but I do want to give you some time to do a quick plug because I know you've got a lot of cool projects coming up. You have a documentary coming up. You have um, all these offerings at your restaurant. I know a lot of restaurants have also suffered during the pandemic. So any way that you, know, you want to share with our community here today about how we can support you, um, I want to give you the quick floor before we close off. Sure. Um, yeah. So, you know, first and foremost, if you want to find out what I'm up to, like follow me on social media. So um, my handle on uh, Twitter, Facebook and Instagram is The Blind Cook. And I have two restaurants uh, in Houston, both in Houston. One is called The Blind Goat. Uh, because I was born the year of the goat and I'm known as the blind cook. The <laughs> second one is called Sin Jiao, which means hello in Vietnamese. Uh, and, you know, they're both Vietnamese uh, restaurants with a modern twist. Um, and actually, I did start something called the Goat Club through the Blind Goat. So if you go to the website, theblindgoat.com, you can read about the Goat Club. And what that is, is, you know, um, once a month, I do, for those who don't live in Houston, I do like um, a cooking live stream or a cooking class. So people can tune in. I send out a list of ingredients and supplies you need ahead of time. And then we have a Zoom session where I, you know, one is actually coming up this Sunday and I'll teach you how to make like a certain dish or a certain recipe. Um, and then if you are in Houston, there's also some other tiers of that, uh, of the Go Club memberships that you can sign up for. 
And that actually involves like coming to the Blind Go to pick up your meal kit that we put together for you. And some of it is already ready to eat. Uh, some of it has some light cooking involved. And we also do another uh, live stream Zoom session um, where I teach you how to put together or how to enjoy your meal kit. So those are some options. We also have like an online um, shop there as well. If you go to the blindgo.com slash shop, you can buy a signed cookbook, um, you know, Sinjiao, htx.com. We have um, t-shirts there that actually we took part of the mural that a, a Houston based Vietnamese uh, artist, she designed a mural in our restaurant. We took part of that and made it into a t-shirt. So a lot of people buy that for gifts. Um, yeah, and about the documentary, you know, it's it's still fairly new news, but I've been filming a documentary that's going to talk about my life story or tell the my life story. Um, we've been filming for a couple years now. Um, it's kind of it's kind of flip flopped, you know, the the narration of it because originally it was about me opening the blind goat as a vision impaired cook that won Master Chef, and then this pandemic happened, so then we were like filming about what it's like to have one restaurant and then open another one during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, like me getting like biannual uh, treatments, like immunotherapy treatments for my NMO, like what that's like means to be living in a pandemic where, you know, I'm concerned about my health, but yet I have two restaurants to run. Um, so we're still working on filming that. Um, but we're, you know, we filmed the sizzle reel recently. We were shopping the, the film around. Um, so, you know, right now it's an independent film. So hopefully we'll enter it in some film fest. So in the future, if you see a documentary from me, like please support it. And then you'll learn even more about my uh, life story and my history and with food and my vision impairment. So I guess that's mostly all the plugs I have. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Christine, for being with us here today, um, and especially, you know, to be our first opening speaker for the Talks at Google celebrations of Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. It has been a delight, and I'm sure everyone here has also felt the same way. So thank you again, Christine. It's been a pleasure. It's my pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Bye.